locally found fossils there from any other from any area. That's a dinosaur backbone joint, that one there. Mm -hmm. That's a woolly mammoth's tooth there. That's a fossilised fern fragment. That's a fish fish fossil, that one. Uh, where are you on that one? That's a fish fossil. Right. That came from Dorset, actually, that one. That's a replica one. That, that there is a crinoid. That's a sea lily. That's a beach fossilisation. Mm -hmm. And you can actually see the plant laid down there with mm -hmm. its with its yeah. lungs going out. That's a beach fragment. Those small items there are Gryphia arcuata. The English call them Cornishman's toenails. Oh, They're yeah. actually fossilised shellfish. Yeah. And these here are ammonites and ammonite fragments. That was a, a creature which had a, the ability to submerge in the water up and down and hunt. Had tentacles like an octopus. On the film uh, Captain, Captain Nemo, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, he had a, a, a submarine called the Nautiloid or Nautilus, that comes from a fossilised, well it's, it's actually alive now, uh, lives in the southern seas, the warmer southern seas, the current day relation of that creature still lives today, uh -huh. and it's called a Naut Nautilus I think, or Nautiloid, the sea creature that lives today, it's a relation of that. Yeah. Well they made a, the United States made a submarine called the Nautilus. Did they? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. That's why From the not. same thing. Yeah. Uh, it's from the same thing. Uh, Oh, what deep, atomic? Uh, oh, deep deep sea one is it? Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's powered by uh, by uh, what they made the atomic bomb out of. Oh yeah. Yeah, those there are different artifacts from around the area. In the middle there are some old English pennies and pennies. This actual pot fragment there, somebody gave me from Jerusalem, which is about 2,000 years old. They found it from a well oh, yeah. that they were digging out in Jerusalem. That there's a caviar container, that's about 1820. Some of the early English stoneware containers had uh, serial numbers on or registration numbers on, mm -hmm. and you can date them exactly. Mm -hmm. That there is a very early Ephraim Hiram Codds bottle. That's the glass stoppered bottle mm -hmm. uh, that people used to break open and take the marbles out of. The beer industry didn't like that bottle when it first came out because they used it a lot for, um, well it was it was actual uh, lemonade bottles. Uh -huh. And they, um, they, they derided it and didn't like it so they called it codswallop and that's where that comes from, that terminology. That there's a, um, these, these, are, these aren't that old but a lady whose husband died of cancer donated those to the museum. Mm -hmm. And they're miniatures from all over the world. There's the Spanish one there, the Dutch one there, yeah. the ginseng, every type of... Uh, if you want the cut glass off so you can film it better, if it's reflecting back, I can mm. soon take the cover off. No, it's all right. Are you sure? That's fine. Thank That's you. woolly mammoth tusk there. That was found in a local gravel pit, as were the ammonite fragments. Mm -hmm. with, with those, you lay them on the floor with a piece of string and a mm. piece of chalk uh -huh. and you can work out the diameter of how big it was from a fragment. Oh yeah? That one there was probably about three foot diameter or more. Hmm. It's quite a big one. Amazing. Those clay pipes um, are all local. The smaller ones are the oldest ones, they're late 16th century and the bigger ones, the church warden ones, are about the early 9th century. When the tobacco roots started in the Americas, the tobacco was very dear. Yeah. As the tobacco roots got better and the tobacco got easier to farm, the tobacco got cheaper and the pipes got bigger. Right. It's normally economic pressures that dictate the way things are, even in those days. Yeah. That picture there is from Dorchester High Street. That's down by the George Hotel. 18... 1875 that sketch is from. Hmm. I've got the original in the house of that hmm. one. That's all. This, it, well. that's, that's my grandfather there. That's in the Bullnose, Bullnose Morris factory. Kelly works at Oxford. That's 1921. That's my dad's dad there. Mm -hmm. It's hard taking the you know the pictures. Yeah. Off of pictures. Yeah. Uh, 
that's down by the post office, that's about 1920 that one. A lot of these pictures, these early black and white ones, were taken between 1850 and 1910 by the chap that was the missionary college master mm -hmm. down near the abbey. There was a teaching college there, a religious teaching college, and one of his only sort of hobbies was photography. And we're very fortunate because we've got some of these very, very early pictures that he took. There's a record of about a hundred pictures, but I've got some of the uh, the main ones from around the area, and they're all dated, fortunately. Glad you said that. So why? We I'm just going to put the date on here. Yeah. When I when I'm taking these. Yeah. Do you want me to speak about the pictures while you do them? Yeah, so you, that's so you've got fine. It. Yeah, that that barn was destroyed. Um, eight, 1890. That's one of the church barns. The church used to have quite a lot of ground in the village, uh -huh. which was donated from, from patrons in the village, and they would use that to finance their resources and, and store their materials and whatever. Uh -huh. That's Br Bridge End Village Green. That's down the southern end of Dorchester. That used to originally be the main way into the village. The bridge was over to the left that come into the village. The, the last bridge was done about 17... 11 I think the the new bridge that we that we now go over which is the longest bridge over the narrowest stretch of, of water in Oxfordshire that bridge mm -hmm. and that bridge took about 12 years to build but this originally was the early way into the village this would be the main part of the main high street coming in with the bridge was on the left there this this next picture this is where the new bridge is as we come into the village there's the abbey on the right yeah you would come over this long bridge on the right there is the toll house. Yeah. In America you have turnpikes. Yeah. It's an English toll, terminology yeah. to pay for the road. Right. That is the toll house. Uh -huh. You would pay there to go over the bridge. There would have been a small barricade. And that's a very small house. And actually, um, if you come down a bit, there's the White Hart Hotel in the village of the, of the High Street. That's the early part of the century. That's looking north up the High Street. Below that is actually where you're resident at present. That's Overy Mill, 1907. Oh yeah. You're in the house on the right there. Yeah. Very, very little unchanged. Hmm. The the picture below is a, is approximately 1889. That's a picture that I've taken of a picture. That's Day's Lock with Whitlam clumps in the background. Oh, yeah. Very, uh, very early picture. You, there's there's dwellings and that on there which actually aren't there any longer. This next picture is actually the, the village recreation ground. The recreation ground was given to the people of Dorchester around the late 1800s, 1880, 1890, somewhere around there. And everybody in the village turned out with their horse and carts to see uh, the day through uh -huh. when the people were given this large piece of meadow land for the recreation purposes. And still up until today, everybody's allowed free use of it. Hmm. And. Um, it's quite interesting to read the old document where the chap says that the young lads must not get in a riotous yeah. behaviour and there must not be excesses of alcohol and, and that actually is my parents house there that one in the middle and there is the play public house and the main road comes from the left and goes up the top there mm -hmm. that's nice that's very interesting these, these other pictures here these are copies of early Victorian advertising brochures that used to be around in the late 18, early 19th century. I've put those in because they are they show containers and they're to do with yeah. with bottles and exhibits and, and stuff from that sort of era. Uh -huh. It's good to have something to relate to that's that's colourful that you can actually see how they used to advertise stuff. Oh, yeah. They wouldn't get away with quite a bit of it in the medical stuff that they used to advertise. That looks familiar. Yeah, that's a picture. That's looking down the high street. That's looking south with the White Hart again on the left. That is the petrol pumps that we own up until recent. That's when they were old hand pumps. Yeah. That must be around 1930, 1940, somewhere around that sort of period. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hmm. That next one that you're looking at, Jolly's Duchess Pills, is typical of the Victorian advertisements that used to be around. That particular one is from 1897. 
I have actually a book which is called Hearth and Home, hmm. which is uh, full of advertising literature, and there's actually a picture of Queen Victoria in it as well. Mm -hmm. Who put the boat in the bow bottle? Oh, that was uh, actually, when I go on holiday, I yeah. tend to uh, see if there's any little bits of interest yeah. that I can get and put in to put on display. Mostly those are all beer bottles. Yeah. They are dark glass because the beer in a clear glass tends to ferment on the inside of the glass. It's not harmful, but it puts, puts like a misty yeah. color on the glass. Those bottles, to get those that dark color, nine times out of 10, all the early uh, glass manufacturers would do, would put some soot in the glass mix uh -huh. and that would turn it black or dark. Yeah. These are mostly tea, Lipton's tea, or coffee containers, yeah. essence of coffee. The early glass is green, uh, selenium yeah. came in from America yeah. during the First World War. When we were at war with the um, Germans in the First World War, right. we used to use manganese to purify the glass, mm -hmm. which gave it that green tinge. Yeah. In the 1914-18 war, the Germans wouldn't sell us any. The Americans sold us selenium, and then you get the clearer glass, what I would cure, call more like a crystal glass, uh -huh. more purer. That came from America. Hmm. These uh, earthenware containers, I've got varying selection of sizes there. These were all used for fire grate blacking containers. What you did was, like the lead polish for the fires, for the old steel fires, uh -huh. what you did was you got a piece of stick, put a piece of wad of cloth on it, tied it on, and these are all large top jars, so you could get right down the bottom and get it off, and then you rubbed it on the fire grill, polished it off, and it gave it that nice black luster. Mm -hmm. They're all varying sizes. Mm -hmm. The one, the bottom one, that's Ephraim Hiram Cod, that's the cod bottle, or glass stoppered bottle. This was an English invention that came in around 1850 to try and keep mineral waters, or fizzy lemonade, or coke as yeah. we call it, keep it with a fizz. Mm -hmm. They found with corks in, the corks would dry out and the gas would escape. That particular bottle, the glass was stuck in the top of the bottle, and what it did was, do you want to just show that? I can, can you shoot that? Yeah. When they were made, these were cast in a two-piece rickets mould. You can just see the join there. This would be the owner of the of the of the bottle factory would have this on. This actually is a local one. This is Abingdon Brewery. Mm -hmm. When they made this bottle, the glass would have been put in after they'd made this outer body. The ball would be stuck in there, which became known as the marble. This was stuck on after, and then an India rubber seal was put in there. When they filled it full of aerated mineral water, or lemonade as we call it, they would turn it upside down, give it a shake, that would agitate the gas, and it would force the ball onto the rubber seal. Right. Once it's locked on there, they could turn it over and it would stay there. Oh, yeah. There was a stick on the bottle to push it in so you could drink it, and there's, there's actually interlocking grooves there, hmm. so that you could pour it over, and the ball wouldn't interact with the top. Yeah. And it was the first true reusable bottle. Very clever idea. Yeah, it is. yeah, very clever. Americans invented a better method about 10 years before. It was known as the crown top bottle, no. or as we know it, bottle top basically. No. But of course, the English, as usual, were very reluctant to take on that method. Right. We, yeah. we stuck with this for a while. Those there, there's a, a numerous artefacts in that container. This actually is a Victorian bed warmer. Mm. This was filled with hot water and put in the bed and that would warm the bed up. Um, these coins are, are local coins that I found in the local recreation ground. Thrupney bits, uh, pennies, halfpennies, other odds and ends. These are all uh, from, from within um, a thousand yards of my house. Mm. And there's a ball there, might be a musket ball but I doubt it. Um, the horseshoe there is Norman, that one, that's Norman. Actually horseshoes, there's a lot of uh, information on horseshoes and the blacksmiths varied the designs over the years and you can actually date them quite accurately and find out a lot of history about horseshoes. That there is, is from the war, that's a live 303 shell that the British forces would have used on the recreation oh, yeah. ground for training and that is still totally loaded as you can see. Yeah. That is an army thing there. 
that is a, a see the one there that's ATS I think that's air training services or something yeah. like that that was a badge that I found laid on there probably where they were having uh, training or whatever on the recreation ground and um, that got lost these are different different types of mineral water as they varied over the years there's salt glazed brown glass green glass they varied the fixings on the top some had screw top Mm -hmm. Some had what we call bullet stopper, which was in the bottom that, that in theory was supposed to come up and locate. Mm -hmm. um, they vary over the years. This is a very interesting type, this particular one. This was known, known as a torpedo bottle, bottomed Hamilton bottle, and that type of bottle was specifically designed. It was an early method of keeping mineral water aerated. The theory was, if it wouldn't stand up, it would lay on its side like a wine bottle and it would keep the cork moist. Yeah, right. And uh, that was your, that, this is actually from Henley on Thames, this particular bottle, yeah. mineral water bottle. They call that a blob top, where it's reinforced to stop the cork yeah. breaking it. Yeah, hey, that is a good idea, because it can't stand up. You have that's to right, that's right. You could put it in like that, that's a pontil base, that is. That's for like putting it at, at a table, you could pour it straight in a cup and drink it. These are, this is another another method on the same thing. That's a bullet. What we what we called a bullet stopper bottle. That particular one. Mm. That's Oxford again. That's a local one. Eclipse, Eclipse aerated mineral water cola. Oxford. That's a bullet stopper bottle. That bullet's in the bottom. And in theory, you could fill that with fluid. Put your hand over it. Turn it over, and it would go down in and locate. Yeah, but right. it wasn't very effective because obviously they'd lose some fluid. Right. Um, they 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 could get problems with that one. The ball was much more successful in Ephraim Hiram Cod's bottle. These are all these are all ginger beers. Um, some are local, some are out of the area. There's varying types there. Mostly screw top, some are cork top, and there's the American influenced one. Thompson's that's High Wickham, that's not far away. That's a, a crown top or bottle top as we would call it. These are all uh, mostly local ones. Hmm. Man, that took a lot of time for you to get all in bottles together. Great deal of time. Oh. This, this here, I don't know whether you can see it very well. No, you can't make it. No. Out. It's too far, you know, you yeah. can't focus in on it, right? Yeah. These are all local stoneware containers. Uh -huh. Mostly Victorian. Um, there's caviar containers there, other bits and pieces. This particular one's of, of, of local interest. Mm -hmm. This is world renowned Seville marmalade, Frank Cooper's Oxford marmalade. You can still get this in America, oh, yeah. and you can still get it at a lot of the top places. He packed in selling it a few years ago and sold the uh, sold the patents to uh, other people so that they can manufacture it under his name and get royalties from it. This man, his relation lives in the village. Yeah. And his son has a 1927 Austin 7, and he is the second owner. Hmm. And they bought it from the from the Leyland Nuffield Works in Oxford, off the forecourt. Those there are all ink containers. You've got there what was that one there is called a cottage ink. It's shaped like a little house. Hmm. You could lay the pen, lay your, your lay your pen each side or octagon, beehive, a bell ink. There's a salt glazed one. Coloured glass, square, purple, those are blue, that's green. The tops of these were very quickly, they were quickly manufactured in moulds yeah. and the tops are all sheared off. Yeah. The reason the tops were sheared was so that the cork, when you jammed the cork in it, would jag on the glass yeah, right and the cork right. wouldn't come out easy. Right. Helped, it, helped it lock in there a bit better. Over the back there, you probably can't see it. Let me just undo that a bit for you so you don't get so much feedback off the light. Over at the back there, that particular one is one that the ink is supposed to never come out of if you knock it over. Yeah. If it's half filled, in theory, it should stay below. Right. Looks more like an animal trap of some description, yeah. doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. But those the inkwell containers took a lot of time to get together. The ones below, these are salt glazed. Uh, mostly salt glazed kitchen containers vary in Victorian era. You can date them, but mostly they're about late 1850 to 1910, mm -hmm. around that sort of period. 
this here, you must, you must, you must have something like this in oh, the states. Yeah. We we call it a gin trap. Yeah. That goes down and locks over like yeah, right. like so. They're illegal you, to use in, in Pennsylvania now because they the jaws injured, ripping. Yeah, yeah. They got teeth and injured the legs. You can you can use them in the UK, yeah. provided there's no teeth on them. Yeah. If you remove those teeth, yeah, right, you can use them. That's the way with ours too. And, and in and in and in France actually is the same too because I go to France now and then, yeah. and they have them on on poles and that for the magpies, yeah. mm. and they've no jaws on them so that they catch them and uh, they just stay in there. These are a selection of of local horseshoes, from cart horse, shire horse, race horse. Uh, that there could be uh, a mule or something of that description. That's a, a Shire horse again. They vary. Mm -hmm. Another trap. That's right. Yeah. If you'd have told me, I could have gone round with the duster no, for five that's, minutes. That's all right. That's are you sure? Yeah, I'm fine. If you want any of the glasses off, you tell me, and then you can. No, no, that's fine. You can get you get less reflective problems. Yeah, I know. That's that's an unusual one. That one there, this one on the left, the extreme left, this light and dark brown one, that is actually a, a animal suckling unit for the for the Victorian farmers. Oh, yeah. There are nine outlets on there. Yeah. They would fill it full of warm milk and put nine teats on it, stand it on a bale of hay for a load of piglets or sheep oh, yeah. or lambs to go round mm. to suckle off of. Yeah. The item there is a World War One German bayonet that was found in the village locally. Mm. A very terribly, to me, nasty looking piece of equipment. <laughs> complete with a scabbard, the, yeah. the protecting sheath. Needless to say, it's typically German. It's very good quality and well engineered. Yeah, right. <laughs> Well, now let me just get a picture of you, too. James Pratt. James Pratt, that's right. Yeah, he's a bottle collector, and that was his collection you just saw, and that was him narrating for me. He was very kind to do that. Thank you very much, James. You're very welcome. I hope you enjoy your stay in England, and come back and see us again, please. Okay, thanks a lot. You're okay. more than welcome. Okay, then. Please.